Hi guys, it's me, Ron Funches. Thank you for listening to the podcast. I appreciate that so much. If you want to support the podcast, there's several ways you can do it. One of the best ways is through patreon.com slash getting better with Ron, where you can become a Patreon supporter starting at as little as $2. Uh, You can get things such as thank you notes. You can get your own shout out on the podcast. That's starting at the $10 level. Get your own personal affirmation. Help with whatever you need focus on, what you're working on. Uh, We'd love to send you something personally you can also reach us on instagram at getting better podcast if you want to join us on instagram see what episodes are coming listen to past affirmations uh, that's the way to do that you can also email us at getting better pod at gmail.com the twitter is getting better pod uh, you can go to my website romfunches.com where you can get t-shirts get your own getting better t-shirts find out all my dates where i am gonna be come support me i appreciate it Thank you for listening to the podcast. Let's get started. Housing's gone when and bring up. Hi guys. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the podcast, watching the podcast, consuming it however you choose to. It means a lot to me and all of us are getting better because it's probably the only place where I get to uh, just fully say whatever the fuck I want at any given time and people listen to it or sometimes they don't. So it's fun and it's cathartic for me and I appreciate you. So thank you. And we should thank some of our Patreon supporters. If you want a shout out on the podcast, all you got to do is donate as little as $5 to patreon.com slash getting better with Ron. You can get a shout out on the podcast, just like my man, Daniel. You know you're a king. I love what you're doing, everything that you're about and everything you're going to be. Keep pushing it. Evan Conrad, you amazing. I met you in Vancouver recently. Yeah, big fan and supporter of the podcast. Friend of the podcast podcast friend of the podcast evan conrad it's a pleasure to meet you and your wonderful lady whose name i have forgotten and i apologize because you are also individual uh jeffrey you are super dope oh thank you jeffrey with the big donation we appreciate you man you a oh, pleasure oh what a king of a person you are thank you uh giovanni that's just a beautiful name so you know we love you bonnie classic name not that many bonnies out there anymore i love it i hope you're either a ceo or slanging hash and nothing in between bonnie <laughs> Amber, you know I love you. Another friend of the podcast. You know we love you, Amber. Thank you. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I hope you. I hope I see you again soon. Uh, Valentine. Oh, that's just a cool ass name. My main man, Valentine, supporting the podcast. We appreciate you, sir. Matt, Matt. We just starting the gang. I think just Bonnie, Matt, Matt, and Valentine. We just. <laughs> hanging out getting better together and that sounds cool you know who else is gonna be there lauren from san diego we love you lauren you're so wonderful and sweet and beautiful and kind and intelligent we appreciate you kendrick what a beautiful name i love that as well as jen noah and last but not least the tin bell pod which i assume is a podcast um that i cannot tell you anything about but they support me so i support them 10 bell pod favorite podcast <laughs> oh, if you want to shout out the podcast if you want your own personal affirmation if you want free tickets to shows like my upcoming shows i'm going to be in indianapolis this weekend at the helium there i'm going to be in maryland i'm going to be uh in hawaii in honolulu celebrating my birthday may 14th i have a show in, in hawaii get all that information at ronflushes.com and if you want to support us again it's patreon.com slash getting better with ron now let's get into our affirmations people been asking me a lot about these affirmations like they're weird are they a weird thing i didn't think they were weird uh but people keep bringing them up saying that they're uh, you know a weird part of the podcast and either they like them or um they think they're too preachy and they get nothing from them uh so either way <laughs> i'm not gonna stop doing it because sometimes i go back and listen to it and it helps me feel better because sometimes i don't even know i say something and i gotta go back and listen to it and be like oh i need that advice right now so let's get into them you know how they start say it along with me if you know i hope you're feeling strong 
hope you're feeling brave. Hope you're feeling loved. I hope you're feeling grateful for that love. Hope you're feeling kind. I hope you're feeling happy where you are are and patient and and just about your yourself and and self-confidence oh i love self-confidence just knowing deep down inside that you that no one's better than us and we're better than nobody that's what we always say and it doesn't come from um from achieving anything it doesn't come from outside sources it just comes from our inner knowing that we are wonderful strong amazing people and it's good to get a win trust me that that is wonderful nice when the world uh recognizes your hard work by giving you something that you've been working towards and i remember last week we talked about how it was gonna be a big week for me and i had a test audition and i had my um pitch for my show to see if if we're going to be able to write it and uh, test did not go well i did not like it uh but i mean i did well i thought i did amazing uh the two people were testing we're going to be the brother of the main character and the other two people were white so i was like i probably don't got this And guess what? I didn't have it. Uh, but it was all right. Who cares? We could have a bad day every now and again. It felt like it was. I didn't like it because it just felt like, uh, you know, just classic Hollywood story. Like, why am I even here? What are they going to do? All of a sudden, what's going to happen? He has a black brother or what? I don't know. I don't. It's not my duty to know, I, you know. And I think that's a part of life is sometimes um, we get so caught up and think that we can't we can't be annoyed and we don't deserve to go through that stuff and it's just like sometimes you just got a shitty day and you go through shit you don't want to deal with i didn't want to have to deal with that i was sitting there and I'm like okay well clearly i'm not gonna get it but i still went out and tried to knock it out the park why because i don't know what else could come from it maybe the director there will see me and want me to put me in something else maybe um in at, at the very base i just don't want to mail it in because i don't like doing bad i like doing well I like trying hard as much as fucking people put you down for it these days. Call you a try hard. But I I like trying hard. That's how you fucking win. I don't understand. How are you supposed to win if you're not trying hard? People just say they're not trying hard so they don't get their feelings hurt when they lose. But fuck it. We'll get our feelings hurt. We'll get knocked in the mud. We'll get dirty. That's That's living life. That's what life is, getting knocked around, getting victories, getting losses, getting memories, making new nostalgia. So that's what we're just trying to do. Um, I didn't get that test, but good news is they say that I can work on writing my show. Doesn't mean it's going to get made, but they did not turn it down. So that's good. That's a positive. And um, it's cool when you get those things because it's, it's, it's so... As much as I've been like, oh man, I want, I want that so bad, biggest deal in the world. My manager was like, oh yeah. They said they're into it. And then she started talking about other stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, this is just a small part of it. Things get so much bigger in our heads, you know? And it's just like, I got to keep working. And it's just an opportunity to keep working. And I'm going uh, to get working on my health. It's been a while since we checked in on health. And um, still, same old, same old damn struggle. You know what it is working on it i've been eating a lot better a lot less red meat um a lot more veggies a lot of salads a lot of fucking salads uh but then on saturday i had a burger from this place called gold burger la it was amazing i loved it and i'm did not i'm not upset about it also got ice cream um apparently there's a, just a abundance of treats in my neighborhood that i don't know about because i never walk around uh, <laughs> uh but i loved it it was a good day watch some pro wrestling and then now i'm back on my diet and i'm hoping if i don't mess it up I'm like okay this is that balance that i need to have this will be the part of my life that we can do instead of just continuing punishing myself for eating cake or ice cream it's just like okay saturday was the day where we ate one ice cream and then we stopped and we didn't go through and eat a whole box of cereal um, still working on it, still dealing with the eating addiction issues, trying to talk about it on stage. Um, starting to feel a little bit like oh, I gotta work on a new special. Um for me, and also just cause like I wanna I love stand up and I get I mean the it contradicts the things I'm trying to say. I got, I think I got to figure this out within myself. But you know, Netflix has a new uh uh 
festival coming out and then it's like a boom that's like oh okay that's all the cool kids that's not me you know and it makes me feel disrespected as a comedian but also um i don't just understand that i don't i don't work with them so why would they put me in their festival but also i know if i'm not in your festival you missing an amazing comedian at your fucking festival (laughs) but there are fucking tons of us so it's just about me being like oh this is where i am I'm going to be comfortable where I am. Not everybody knows me. Not everybody digs what I do. This podcast is the main example. This is what I do. This is what I love. This is what I'm about. Some people get value out of it. Some people think it's trash. I don't care. You're both right. But either way, I like working. So I'm going to work. And I'm going to push things forward. I'm going to work on my act and try to put a new special out, hopefully. Uh, Maybe be ready sometime next year. Who knows? Just let life tell me, you know? I'm trying to focus on not doing what, focusing on what I can't do and just focus on what I can. That's the main, one of the main lessons my mom taught me. And when I got so many things going on with acting, writing, voiceovers, and um, trying to do stand up, trying to be a good father, take my son to see Sonic the Hedgehog, which was amazing. I loved it. It was not a good movie. Uh, but- <laughs> But sometimes it doesn't have to be a good movie. I just watch it with my son and watching him love it, watching all the kids love it, and seeing a bunch of people who who I like in it. I like Adam Pally, he's a cool dude. Um, I, ben Schwartz, he's a cool dude. I like a lot of people who are involved in it. And then my favorite, one of my favorite movie moments happened in that movie at the very end. Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert for the Sonic the Hedgehog film. But at the very end, after the first credit sequence. Tail shows up who is Sonic's best friend and, and you, if you don't know that I don't know if I should even be fucking with you uh, but Tail shows up Miles Tail's powers shows up and he, and then this when I look over there's a 13 year old chubby black girl who is just freaking out and she's just like oh what Tails and then the credits hit right after Tails shows up and then she just goes no <laughs> She wanted tell so bad, and she only got a little taste. She just got to wait till the sequel. Oh, it made me so happy, and it made me want to be like, oh, that's what I want to do. I want to be in movies like that, and uh, provide people good moments like that, and also make good money. <laughs> <laughs> that's important no matter what your job is whatever you want to do i think that's the thing that i always want to um talk about when it comes to this podcast it's not about being like oh your job sucks getting to the arts someone interviewed me today and they were like oh you worked a bunch of jobs before you got into comedy at what point did you go like oh i'm sick of this and i want to go do comedy it's like it wasn't that i was sick of working i've always been sick of working i hate jobs i hate jobs within comedy you know, I didn't get into comedy to fucking work at a set I don't like. You know, I like what working on what I'm passionate about, but that's not what life is always. You gotta pay the bills. So sometimes you gotta work. It wasn't that I was like, oh, I hate jobs and who could possibly, uh, ooh, who could work? It's like everybody's gotta make fucking money. I'm not above anything. And, but it was just that that's what my passion was. And if I can make money off my passion, that's a win win. So if you can do that, that's a win win no matter what your, what your passion is. It doesn't have to be comedy, it could be woodworking. It could be, I know people out there selling furniture you know and trying to turn that into their full-time job the point is is to not settle for the middle not settle for 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 being mediocre and waiting for an employer to tell us when we can get a raise or an employer to tell us when we're worthy or something because usually they just tell us when they're going out of business and that you got uh, your severance has been cut so it's just about protecting yourself you know that's all we talk about on here is getting better to protect yourself, getting better in your health, getting better in your finances, getting better with your relationships, to protect yourself and not rely on other people. It's about self-reliance. And that's the fuck I love. Uh, Because I used to not be in there. I used to try to rely on other people. And that led to horrible times where I was living in the Oregon coast in a flop house in a converted roller skating ring owned by a guy named Johnny Midnight. Does that sound stable? Does that sound like a stable place to put your child? No. <laughs> 
It wasn't. They were all trying to sell mushrooms and stuff. And it was the first time I smoked weed with a bunch of stoners and they would have a smoking circle and they would just each bring their own pipe and keep hitting their own pipe. That's so weird. That's a smoking circle for people who have uh, trust funds, you know, and they're selfish. Uh, <laughs> but that's a story for another day. I could tell you guys more about Johnny Midnight and my time in the converted roller skating rink. <laughs> if you want to read the continuing book series of the Funches Boys. <laughs> Cause that's what we talk about. I've been, I've seen shit, dog. But people are always like, "Oh, you doing well?" It's like you don't know where I've been. I slept on fucking mattresses. I fucking mattresses are wonderful. I'm talking. <laughs> I just sleep on mattresses, y'all. <laughs> well, I slept on mats, is what I'm trying to say. I've, I've uh, had to parcel out. You know who, who. How can I find enough money to for feed me, my son, and my my ex wife today? You know, maybe we're all just gonna eat a little Debbie snack today. Each one of us is gonna get a thirty five cent little Debbie snack, and then I'm gonna have to figure out dinner at another time. Um, so I don't even know. It's a it's a rambling podcast. What you get? That's where I went off into. The point is, enjoy your fucking life. Have fun, hustle, protect yourself, and be reliant on yourself and not other people, whether it's significant others, whether it's, it's your parents, whether it's the fucking government, because you know them motherfuckers ain't got your back. <laughs> and let's get into our guest today. Our guest today is a great friend of mine, a friend of the podcast, a wonderful author, uh, a, a certified weirdo. <laughs> And that's what I love. And it's just nice to talk to someone who not just about uh who's not she those she did stand up. She's not currently a stand up. She's the author. It's a um she's Oh, and she's the author of a book called Real Artists Have Day Jobs, which is really what I was talking about. It's about protecting yourself and being self reliant. And not just being uh, uh, so in your own head that you're like, oh, I'll just figure it out. And who 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 cares about the real world consequences? You know, sometimes you got to work a day job until you don't got to work a day job. Sometimes that day job will motivate you. That oppression will motivate you to succeed. Um, and then you get out of it and you feel even better. <laughs> Our guest today is the wonderful, amazingly talented Sarah Benincasa. Enjoy it. It's exciting being, because uh, I watch the videos sometimes. Oh, really? So I feel like I've entered through the fourth wall. Through the looking glass. <laughs> yeah. Like when that kid gets into the TV in Willy Wonka. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or it's like my Narnia. Here okay. amongst the toys. <laughs> oh, these are lovely. Yeah, yeah. They're good stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have fun building the whole scene. Thank you. For, thank you for watching it. I appreciate it. You're welcome. That. I don't see, like, I don't see everyone, but I check in sometimes. I was um, hanging out with, with my friend at a salon today, and she was looking at your feed and was like, who's Stone Cold Steve Austin? I was like, yeah, he's very cool. Yeah, Stone Cold's the best. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it was fun talking to him. Just be like, oh, you as a person is just fun, enjoyable. It was his birthday today. And I texted him, happy birthday. And he just wrote me back, thank you. Isn't it wild that you have his phone number it's in your phone? It's wild. Makes me very happy. And I'm glad that we had a reason for me to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. My other life is being a publicist. Like, I'm always good to set up an anecdote about a friend and like let them run with it that's my dream life well that's not really gonna work well today no it's not i'm gonna have to <laughs> i'm gonna have to do my opposite yeah uh, I'm gonna do opposite talk about yourself mm -hmm. was that easy for you um i think yeah it's pretty easy for me to talk about myself for whatever reason i think i have a sliding doors life i sometimes i say my only superpower is enthusiasm and in my other life, I'm a well-paid publicist, which is rare because usually they don't make enough money. I'm a very high-powered publicist, and my whole day is spent being like, not my client. No, my client won't do that. My client will do that. Like, There's something about getting paid to be codependent that <laughs> I find very attractive. 
It's a way to professionally work out some personal issues. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fun. <laughs> it is. Thank you. Well, I wanted to hear people. Um, people really enjoy you, enjoy your work, enjoy your 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 writing. Um, you do some fun acting as well. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted you to come here because you recently talked about your own journey with getting better and about um looking at the gym how you had your viewpoint on the gym and how it was changing Mm and being from a a place that you didn't enjoy and was a negative place into um where you me talking about empty gyms and how that can be so much fun was helpful for you um is that still going on with you or you find yourself how how, what's your what's what how are you getting better right now what are you working on (laughs) i decided to create my own empty gym my own perpetually empty gym because you had shared with me and you've said publicly that sometimes you know i'm sure you're hitting the gym after a show um or just after or before a call time on set or what have you so it can be in the middle of the night when it's an empty gym but you make sure to get it in where you can um, get that exercise in and um so i got a peloton bicycle to know i call it my bicycle to nowhere and i got a good payment plan that i could afford because i knew i couldn't afford it outright but then a friend of mine said oh no they run this special once a year and it was like zero percent down, zero percent APR. And when I looked at what I would be paying monthly for the bike until I get a big enough check that I just pay it all off, which is my plan. Um, Plus the video, like the membership to the streaming platform where they have live classes, but then archive classes. It was significantly less than my last gym membership. And I hardly used that. So I was like, hmm, I think I'm I'm going to do this because I I over the course of about eight months I talked to a few different people who had it and heard people talk about it and I was like all right and it was before that commercial came out <laughs> that everybody hated which I understand it was a stupid commercial but um I got it and I really like it and it I find it motivating. And I've realized, oh, now I know I'm learning. I'm still learning, but I'm learning the different terms and the different things you do on the bike and the importance of doing yoga or something else to do hip openers and also to exercise your whole body. So you're not just on the bike doing that heavy lower body workout. And I'm thinking now like, oh, I won't be as embarrassed if I want to go try a spin class in person one day, Mm -hmm. which I only did once 10 years ago and I almost threw up after and I never went back because I was so embarrassed. I used to get so embarrassed at the gym. I think I still would because, um, because I, I just, I have this, there's a phase in adolescent development that's very appropriate for adolescent development. And I forget what it's called exactly, but I learned a little bit about adolescent psych when I was um, in my master's program. I have a master's in teaching English and language arts, grades seven through 12. So we studied just a little about adolescent psych. And one of the things we learned about was that they do go through this phase where they feel like everybody's looking at them when they walk into a room, whether or not that's true. That may be true if they did something crazy that everybody found out about and they walk into the cafeteria like in a movie and everybody looks. But typically speaking, that's not actually true. But they feel that way. They have this heightened sense of, it's not quite narcissism. It's not that. It's um, it's very sort of, it seems like an anxiety thing. And that's how I feel when I walk into a gym. I think, oh, people are judging me or people are going to know I don't belong or I'm going to be the most out of shape person here. But because... I have this bicycle to nowhere in my house now. Uh, it's making me less afraid of being in a group class one day or going into the gym one day. And as I get stronger and as I'm able to work out and not feel anxious, it makes me think, oh, okay, I, I have more confidence to work out in a gym where there's people around mm-hmm. someday. <laughs> someday pretty soon, probably. Yeah, well, I would hope so because I think um that fear manifests itself in a lot of different ways and can stop you from um doing things that you want to do and things that you enjoy i know that's a 
fear that a lot of people have when starting anything, starting stand up. That was my big fear of like, oh, what if I get up there and um, this thing that I think is my calling, this thing that I think that I'm supposed to do, the only reason why I, I am not fully depressed that I'm working at this dead end job is because like deep down inside, I think I'm special and maybe I should be doing stand up, but I'm afraid to try because what if I get out there and I'm the worst person out there and I suck and I find out I'm not willing to, you know, I'm not really that good. Um, and, and then I go, then what, what am I meant to do? I don't have any calling, but I found that that was just like, you know, my own anxiety and making things overly dramatic of of like hey you're not going to be excellent when you start anything but um what i find right away is that you're always usually kind of like there'll be people that are obviously great and been doing it for a long time and there's people who are also just starting and they're not good and there's just people who are like how would you even get here and it's just like nobody's even judging everybody everybody's just working at their own pace you're the stage seems so much bigger until you actually step on it, you know, and the gym seems so much um, just like more judgmental and more um, hard to deal with until you're actually there and you realize like, yeah, sometimes people will take a glance at you, and, you know, just to see what you're doing or like, just like if you're a hot person, just checking you out. <laughs> That's what happens at the gym. That's true. I mean. They, they're usually not that interested in what you are doing. They're focused on themselves. And for me, um, because I grew up with a lot of anxiety, issues with anxiety, crippling anxiety, agoraphobia eventually, um, lots of panic attacks, things like that. Uh, social anxiety has certainly been a part of, of my life. And, um, I got sober over a year ago now. Um, but I quit drinking before I got, you know, started working a program and going sober, sober, as it were not California sober, which I was for a minute, <laughs> which was fun, but, um, would have eventually gotten very expensive for me, uh, because I'm not the type of person who can just kind of do it halfway. So I had to really kind of go into do the whole thing. But, um, what I found when I removed alcohol specifically from my life was that all this anxiety came up that I didn't even remember had been there. You know, I'm 39, so I quit drinking when I was 37, um, about to turn 38, 37. And I had not realized how since I started drinking when I was 23, how accustomed I had gotten to using it to get me through fearful situations. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense to me now that for year, years, the gym was like this boogeyman to me because I wasn't drinking before I went to the gym. Some people do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> More power to them. But I, I, I wasn't. And so even though I wasn't somebody who got blackout drunk ever or who put anybody else's life in danger by driving drunk or anything like that. Like I still was using it more and more as I got older to get me through different situations. And I actually think about, right. It's striking me right now, sitting here with you talking about it that I hadn't until this moment really thought about the gravity of that and how that might've been attached to, to the gym and stuff. Cause if you were like, Sarah, you got to go to the gym by yourself and you got to go do a class or you got to go work on the machines or whatever. I would say, OK, uh, and then not do it. But if you said, Sarah, you know, I used to do stand up and if you say, Sarah, you got to go into this club. You've never been there before and you got to do 15 minutes. I would be anxious and I would I have enough respect for the craft to know that I'd be rusty as hell and probably would suck. But I wouldn't have the same level of fear as if you were like, oh, no, you have to go to the gym and you have to work out and people are probably going to notice. Like mm -hmm. that would be scarier to me because that's not that's not my strength. You know, I didn't grow up feeling comfortable in my body and feeling strong, feeling athletic. And but I could be funny mm -hmm. or I could tell a story. Even if the story wasn't funny, I could tell a story. I'm just going all over the place. I'm sorry. I'm rambling I'm like, right now. That's this podcast. <laughs> I love this podcast. Thank you. I'm a fan of the. I am a Patreon subscriber. Oh, to this, yeah. this is the first media thing I've ever been on or in, I think, where I was. Uh, no, that's not true. I mean, there's been like newspaper interviews where I've subscribed to the newspaper, but certainly the first podcast where I've been a, a Patreon supporter, a very minor one, but still. 
uh, and, and gotten to do the podcast. So well, we thank you, and we thank all Patreon subscribers. Um, maybe you too one day. <laughs> <laughs> If you're watching and mm -hmm. you're not yet a Patreon subscriber, I'm going to encourage you to do so because you can get access to a host of benefits, rewards, and thank you presents if you so choose. It's patreon.com slash getting better with Ron. Getting better with Ron. I'm a member. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love Patreon. I have one for a, um, Patreon.com slash Sarah Ben and Casa. Um, I have a weekly newsletter that I write, which is like a miniature zine, mm -hmm. like a 90s zine, except I don't have to cut it out and and draw and marker and write a poet poem about my feelings, although I could if I wanted to. Um, it's just a weekly thing with like I've recommended this podcast on it. Um, oh, it's just for subscribers you. only. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice that we, you can still it's like because a lot of times we um among the fact that those things are gone but in so many ways they're still alive and, and and it's just crazy how many ways there are to reach um a fan base no matter what size it is and people who want your content and and enjoy your work and actually you you help um it's just like i think it's a great time to be an artist and one thing that really interests me about you is that you're very open about your anxieties and in the different um things you've 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 dealt with in your life but you've already you're also a very accomplished writer and and that seems like the two could be very difficult to to manage as well that sometimes um those type of same type of fears although you said you're, you're confident in those abilities so that would be um but it's it's just kind of a weird juxtaposition that you feel like you can't go to to the gym, but you can write novels. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I can do hard things, just not the hard things that I've decided in my mind are not for me, <laughs> that I'm not good enough to do. I can do anything as long as I haven't decided that no other people do that. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday whose brother is a very accomplished screenwriter. And she said, you know, she has stories to tell, but it never occurred to her to do it because he's so good. He's magic. Like he must be, it must come naturally to him. You know, he's so accomplished. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that I often have told myself that about different things. And as you get older and you get more confidence, hopefully we're able to say more and more, well, why not me? Why not me? It, especially as we start to get to know more people who have won the awards or gotten the paychecks or booked the roles or started the companies or what have you and gotten this success as you start to get to know those people, not just to read their words from afar, but if you ever get to actually meet them. Um, and sometimes we get to work with them and you go, wait, you, I can do this. And it's not always because so-and-so who you thought was so brilliant is actually kind of a dumbass mm -hmm. or is actually kind of rude or whatever. It's sometimes it's not that it's not about punching down at those people or punching up, I guess in this case, it's, it's more going, Oh, you're a human. You're a human mm -hmm. being like I can do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to bring more of that energy into the next year of my life. I think it's a lot like um, growing up and realizing your parents were just normal people like you and and they can make mistakes and didn't know what they were doing half the time and that's how i feel about hollywood is that a lot of times there's there's very few there are some people who are true geniuses mm -hmm. in in this business and um are just special at what they do but it's a term that gets thrown around so much out here when you really realize like oh this person is just kind of good at that one thing like they are really good at that but they can't go do something else like you see some people are great hosts who are horrible stand-ups there are people mm -hmm. who are great stand-ups who are horrible actors and you know it moves all the way around i've met yeah like just what you said i've met some people who like created these big big shows and i meet them and i'm just like oh you just did that you don't really know much about actual comedy mm -hmm. you just know that sometimes they know how to hire people who are good at things how to place people who are good at things or how to say okay i'm a showrunner i'm good at structure or strategy and i'm good at hiring people who are good at hiring the people who will be great at this other times it's not even that other times they're just like i did a great pitch 
Mm -hmm. I have the right relationships. And other times they are brilliant in a, a word that gets thrown around so much. But once in a while, you're like, oh, no, you're actually brilliant at this. You are so good at this. And sometimes, too, I'm also thinking about how when you see actors out here who are trying stand up just for fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is always so funny to me because having because i spent so many years doing stand-up i have such respect for it um and i think a very realistic real world way not in a oh wow how could anybody ever do that way but in a oh no i've done that and i i see what it is when somebody is committed to it at a deep level who is out there working dropping in doing the work uh all that stuff where it's not just it's not just for fun it's not just a social thing it's not just something they get paid for once in a while it's not just a for me it was a strategy to other things i knew i could differentiate myself if um if i did stand up i could differentiate myself as a writer and uh especially at that time when i started stand up in like 2006 i guess i was in grad school nobody was publishing what i wrote so i could do stand up i could kind of focus group my jokes and then incorporate that into essays I was submitting to magazines or trying to get jobs blogging in New York and things like that. And it worked. And I was able to get more clips in that world in publishing um, because they would go, oh, you can write a humorous take on this. You're a woman in comedy. That's trendy right now. Mm. <laughs> That's interesting. And um, and that eventually led to me getting my first book deal. And, and I've published five books now. Um, and so... I was going somewhere with that. But my point was, at a certain point, I realized uh, that it wasn't that I was good enough at it, but I wasn't great at it. And I wasn't I didn't take enough joy from it to have the motivation to work to get better. Mm. But I see people who are what I think of as true stand ups, you being one of them, which is not that you're not a multi hyphenate. You are. You're an actor. You're a writer. Uh, you know, you're a producer and blah, 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 and stand up comedian. And maybe it changes by the day how you rank those. Um, but you at least appear to me to genuinely put deep effort into it and to keep working hard and to keep creating and to keep evolving and to keep doing it. And, and that to me is how I, in my brain, categorize a true standup. But it is funny when I see people who are like, yeah, my acting teacher told me to try stand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, okay, but do you really want to? Or is it kind of a pose? Yeah. It's different if you're if you're doing stand-up because you're researching a role where you play a comedian. I absolutely understand that. But why why are you just trying stand-up? Like, like when people are trying stand-up not because they love stand-up, but because they think, well, maybe I have the right look. I'm like, oh God, like mm -hmm. no. Yeah, it's not a true goal. It doesn't come from your heart. It's just kind of this thing you think would be cool, either because you're not informed about what the real life is, or you're like, oh, I because I go to a lot of acting classes where they're just like that, the same thing, where they're just like, it seems like it's easier for stand-ups. And it's just like, well, you're being completely ridiculous. It's just as hard for everyone to do anything. It is lucky and a blessing that then go like, oh, if I Get, make some notoriety from my stand-up it gives me a least a door to someone to look at me but i had to there was a reason why i went to class because they weren't <laughs> just like yeah come on board they were like no you should probably learn how to act <laughs> and i just think you have to respect it and then, like you said if you truly love it i have no problem with anyone who does stand up as a hobby oh or just for fun thing. absolutely yeah. Absolutely. That's cool. But if you're just doing it because you you're chasing a goal that other people are putting on you, that's a waste of your time and effort when there's so many things um, that you can do. Just, just keep trying to get better at acting, I would say. But one thing that you said that struck me was about talking about um, that you just stand up to, to, to get your name out there and different. Diff ah, I can never say words. <laughs> diff diff How do I say it, Halston? It's not coming out of my mouth right. Differentiate? That's the yeah. word. Let me try to say it. Say it again. Differentiate. Oh, no. Differentiate. Differentiate? Differentiate. Differentiate? No. Yeah. I loved comedy always. I loved comedy. I loved watching stand-up. And I loved 
writing. So I was like, oh, stand up is me getting to write on stage. Because sometimes, you know, you write in the moment as you're improvising or you do a you, there's some throwaway line that you're like, wait, this worked really well. Or the audience has some kind of reaction that changes things. So for me, I chose to do it um, because I was like, well, I had never thought until I got to New York and somebody put it to me this way. I'd never thought of stand up as writing. I mm-hmm. think in my mind, I thought I actually thought that every time a comic got on stage, they had written new jokes like I did not realize. Or I remember Oren Brimmer was my friend, is my friend, was my friend then. And um, running my first set ever in front of him, like talking into a water bottle in mm-hmm. front of him in his little room in New York City where... Um, he had like, you know, pictures of Bill Hicks on the wall and was explaining to me like, oh, this is what Mr. Show is. And this is what this is what this is who Sarah Silverman is, or what she's up to now and all kinds of stuff that that I, you know, I don't know. And this is oh, this guy, Reggie Watts, does these shows down in the village. And so at that time, um, you know, when I discovered that it was something you honed and refined, that was intriguing to me because also writing is lonely <laughs> And writing when nobody's publishing it, so you're not getting feedback on it, is extra lonely. And this was a way to write and to get instant feedback on it. And then, of course, I fell in love with, um, for a while, the feeling of people laughing. Mm -hmm. Like, that felt really good. It does feel real good. It does. I love that feeling. And it did differentiate me from other people um, who were my age who wanted to write memoirs mm. because I had a different perspective. Also, by the time I, you know, I started stand up in, I think, January 2006. And by the time I got my first book deal in April, I want to say of 2010, so four years and change, I had enough press clips. I had enough, you know, stuff that I'd written, but also like reviews of my stand up, um, reviews of my one woman show, which became my memoir. I did stand up and worked it until it was a one woman show. Um, and then that became the basis for my pitch for my first book. And so, you know, over those four years, I had enough like of an online presence at that time. <laughs> 2010 numbers for Twitter being impressive were not what they are now or Instagram. Did that exist? Yes, I think so. Um, So it all, all those things came together to help me. That's beautiful. I like how like you, you kind of have to, um, you have your main passions and thing that you're doing and you also have to kind of like, what else am I really interested in? What, What else am I interested in? Um, and it just kind of built naturally into what what into this larger book deal that you already were trying to do. You were already trying to get published, but like going back and kind of resetting and seeing what you could do at a small level, and just that because I think that's something that uh, uh, my mom taught me that I, I think is highly important that sometimes people forget is because we get so worried because you're like, oh, I want to write a book. I want to write a movie. I want to make my own TV show. But nobody wants to do with them because they don't know me. And then it's just like, well, that's not something you can change right now. But worry about what you can do. What mm-hmm. could you do at a smaller level that may build into that big thing or at least help you meet new people and have fun and create new relationships that will help you down the road in ways you can't even imagine, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great piece of wisdom from your mom, as are the many pieces of wisdom you share from your mom now and again, or or moments and things you've learned from your life with her. Because like, yeah, you couldn't, you know, I I remember I tried to pitch a, a book in, I was like, 21 fresh out fresh out of a nervous breakdown like just getting better from that with the right medication the right nutrition the right um therapy having dropped out of school preparing to go back into a new school and i wanted to write about it right away but it wasn't time yet i hadn't lived enough i had not um you know eventually i would write that book uh when i was um 20 29 and 30 and it would come out when I was 31. So I needed time. Art needs time. I needed time. I didn't have the I I didn't learn some things I needed to. I didn't have some adventures I needed to and I never thought I would write the book on stage, but I 
did. I wrote at least the skeleton of it on stage because I um I loved that, like being on stage, telling stories, uh, seeing how the audience reacted, refining it, changing it, the relationships I made, the friendships I made, the weird different shows you end up doing, like 50 First Jokes in New York when it first started, um, where you do, I know you know this, but I don't know if you know this, um, audience, uh, you, you know, they do 50 comedians telling ostensibly their first joke of the year, and they do it in LA now too, I think. Um, but And weird like live talk shows about strange topics in a black box theater in the middle of the night or one time at UCB and I didn't go through that system doing improv. Improv always scared me because of the lack of control because you had to depend on other people. And I was like, I can't handle that. Mm -hmm. But I would I've performed so many times at those theaters on both coasts, as I know you have as well, because they do book you for different things. Um, And uh, one time I did a baton twirling routine. And I, I, it was a character and she didn't speak, but she was a, a Christian, evangelical Christian baton twirler. And she did a, a baton twirling routine to butterfly kisses. And it became very sexual at one point. And we learned a lot wordlessly about her relationship with her own father. And that's not something I would have gotten to do in front of 200 people, which might have been a good thing Mm -hmm. uh, if I wasn't doing stand up. I mean, I get to act like two or three times a year. And I always say I have the best acting career in the world, which is that two or three times a year, friends of mine who are better at stand up than me, way more dedicated, not harder to be better, not harder to be way more dedicated. And also uh, who still like me for some reason, uh, will be like, do you want to come say three lines? Or like, do you want to come do this thing? And I'm like, I get to get my makeup done and I get free food and I get to make new friends. Awesome. I don't memorize that much. I love this. And now I have to join the union as a result. (laughs) (laughs) Good union, good health insurance. Yeah. I mean, if I ever ended up, I mean, I never book an audition. It's Mm -hmm. just like that. It's like two or three times my agents will be like, Somebody wants you to, do you want to play a barista on, do you know? And I'm like, oh, that's my friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go sell three lines. I don't have to remember. Or I, can I make it up? Can I have fun with it? Can I make Okay, cool. Because I'm scared of memorizing lines. <laughs> so that's my acting You're career. Not like Stone Cold Steve Austin in that <gasps> one. Yes. Oh, he and I have so much in common. <laughs> we're both in your phone. <laughs> we both were born and have birthdays. Mm-hmm. That's so exciting. Way different hairstyles. Mm, very different hairstyles. You're a very good actor. You've Thank been you. you've been working. I've heard you speak about classes for years, but you've been, you know, TV movies. Probably, have you ever done a stage play? No, I I would like to. I bet you will. You will if you want to. I do want to. You're gonna yeah. you're gonna be like uh, Death of a Salesman <laughs> as a one man show starring Ron Funches. I don't know why it's in an old fashioned forties man voice. Oh well, yeah, if you're gonna go see Death of a Salesman, why not? <laughs> No, I would love to. I'm just always open to new activities. And I think that would be um, just a really big challenge. And I I do love acting and it's terrifying to me. Um, and it's different, but it's like some, like I love stand up and stand up led me to find acting. And when I found it, I was like, oh, you're like another kid. Like I thought I just had this one kid that I love so much. <laughs> and now it's like, oh, I love both of you guys. And it's so, so cool. fun to do and find myself getting better because I'm usually very honest about it and I a lot of time when people would ask me I go like I'm a great stand-up I'm a mediocre actor <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and now I go I'm a great stand-up and I'm a pretty solid actor I won't put great on there but anything but I go but I know what I'm doing more and more and I'm really into it and I really love it and um, and, and people go watch me in Six Underground it's a pretty fun camera you'll put me in your action franchises <laughs> I would like to be in your commercial campaigns uh I, I would like you know i like a commercial i just did one for dropbox it was very fun i like a commercial i got to read lines off the back of a piece of paper it was great uh but i will memorize for you i would also like just to put into the universe um i would like a commercial campaign i would like a uh, a role on a television show where i show up every few episodes or it can be every episode and i say five to 15 lines and then I go away and then I come back and I just really want to advance the plot Mm -hmm. like 
I don't know, Jim. Like you're sitting at a computer. That's all. Yeah, I'm at a computer, or I'm I'm making coffee. I can make coffee. I can fake make coffee. I can real make coffee. Um, that which is great for the for the crew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could just do crafty. Like I could be doing crafty in front of the camera. Like, because I used to be a barista, I could be pulling really good espresso shots and then we just use it afterwards. I did a short film uh, that I wrote that I was in called The Focus Group and uh, my friend Heather Fink directed it. And um, it's about a woman who's really down on her luck. So she decides to focus group her whole life, her whole body through this boutique advertising agency that just it's sort of like a feel it was supposed to feel. And I think it does feel a little bit like a, a weird Twilight Zone episode. It. Yeah, my boobs are in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so because she gets naked, almost naked in front of this group of people who evaluate her, including uh, Astronomy Club's own Gerard Milligan. <laughs> and they all have this. Anyway, it's like this sort of nightmare thing. But it, but um, it was really fun to do. And I didn't know because my acting career is I just show up three times, two, three times a year and I say three lines. I have never had to eat something on camera before, but I wrote this script and I had to eat something. And Heather was like, Heather's a professional. And she was like, you know, you got to eat. You have to eat one egg roll. So we're going to order 36 to 50 something egg rolls and like what you're going to do is you're going to spit it out mm -hmm. and the we have a crew person who's going to hold up a thing and you're just to spit it out where you keep going and i was like i don't want to disrespect this crew person she's like no that's their job you're paying them that's why we did a kickstarter and i was like no it's cool i'll just eat them and she was like that's gonna she's very sweet and she was like okay she like p pivots really well with mm -hmm. actors being silly and I ate a lot of egg rolls. And then I was like, I cannot do this anymore. And they were like, that's why we have this nice person on the crew that you're paying to hold this up. And I said, thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's really, that's when it shows that you act the two to three times a year. Because yeah. you should, you, yeah, that's the thing you should know. That <laughs> I know. It's so, the first time I auditioned ever, uh, it was a Comedy Central. It must have been, it was for some like animated show. This was like 2006, 2007. And they asked me to slate and I had to go, what is that? I was like, I'm sorry, what? And slating, if you don't know, is that you you say your name, right? You say your name? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Sarah Benincasa. I'm here to audition for the role of... And they go, okay. And then they start. And I did not know that at that time. And I don't know. So I love writing. I'm a, I think I'm a great writer. I think I'm a decent actor i've never you don't have to give me a lot to do i can i can do a decent i'll say decent uh when i'm on my game i'm a good enough stand-up <laughs> <laughs> good enough like all she right was good enough she was good enough. i didn't want to leave i got, it was fine i got to do my favorite gig ever i did last year actually i went to toronto i do stand up once in a while every once in a while i come out of retirement <laughs> not retired but um yeah i spent so much time writing now but uh i went to toronto and i did comedy bar which i love and i opened for sam J a a couple times and then i oh i uh, featured for scott thompson from the kids in the hall yeah, that's good. Yeah, he's that's so good. great and it this was his buddy cole monologues one man show and sandra bottolini was the host and she was great and so it's you know like 400 450 people in this historic theater in I guess Toronto has two little Italy's. This is one of the Royal Cinema, I think. It was the easiest opening or featuring job I've ever had because I was so excited to be there. And the whole audience was insanely excited to see Scott Thompson on, on stage. So I just kind of had to go out and freak out that we were all there. And then they would freak out. Yeah. It was like a hype man game. Like, yeah, it, it was very easy. authentic. Yeah. Super authentic, though. I didn't even like I wrote some jokes because I have some Canadian family. So I did some really basic stuff about like, you know, growing up as a kid in Jersey with these cool older cousins in Toronto who were really determined that I was not just going to be some dumb American kid. Like I was going to know about Anne of Green Gables and I was going to know about Degrassi and I was going to know about all this stuff. But mostly it was just me being like, can you guys believe this is happening? And then being like, no, can you? For like 15 minutes. I was like, this is great. This is delightful. Good enough. She's good enough. She got the audience amped 
and they were already amped. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't de-amp the audience that so was already amped for Scott Thompson. And then he did. That's he was a charmed wonderful. life. It was fun. I think Halston's writing down she's good enough as a possible title for the thing. She is you. good enough. <laughs> yeah. And and I, you know, now I, I write, I write working on another book project. I'm writing, um, uh, I'm writing my first drama pilot just as a sample because I pitched it and nobody bought it. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm just going to write the script. Can you tell me a bit about your writing process and how, um, because you know we get a lot of people who are inspiring writers or aspiring in this field um just maybe something you can tell them about how how you're because that seems like something you're very dedicated in and, do, and it's something i want to be more dedicated in my myself i write a lot on the stage of course but i feel like i um could be a little bit more uh, just polished and more determined in my writing and so i just want to know a bit about how how you maintain that Oh, sure. Well, I, I will say first that, um, you know, I've, the things that I've gotten paid to write include books, essays, advertising copy, jokes, um, social media things, done some ghost writing, done a little punch up, um, on other people's projects and stuff. So, uh, I've done, you know, like cool quote unquote writing where I write a book and my name is on the cover and I get to go on a book tour and then uncool writing, copywriting, promoting things, advertising stuff. And I do that still. Um, one of my books is called real artists have day jobs. And I've, I've had a lot of different day jobs, night jobs, weekend jobs. And some of them are things other people might think were cool, but that I secretly didn't like. So I called them a day job. And some of them are things people that would sound lame to people that I'm like, no, I love this random marketing gig. So with all of that though, um, there is a process that I take, which is that you do have to get into a kind of flow, but the, the flow state doesn't, which a athletes talk about and writers talk about and all kinds of artists talk about that the flow state doesn't show up unless you do. And it doesn't always show up. So what I have found is that for me to do well as a writer, I used to think that I had to stay up all night. I mean, I thought to do a good job on a project and it didn't matter what it was. If you said to me, oh, Sarah, you're in college, write this assignment or, oh, Sarah, you're in your 20s. Um, you are doing a packet for The Daily Show for the first of 11,000 times. Uh, or Sarah, you are going to help write an ad campaign for this nonprofit or you've got your manuscript due tomorrow. Whatever it was, I used to say that my process was driven by panic because it was because I would stay up super late the night. I would leave the bulk of the work, whatever it was, the bulk of the work to the last minute. I would stay up late, never wrote drunk. Coffee, yes, lots and lots of coffee. Never did Coke, never did like uppers, but um, coffee's an upper. So then I love it. I still love it. So I would do it. I would deliver it. And then I would be exhausted for days. I don't recommend that because eventually I burned out. So I think that if you want to be a writer, have a writing career, it really is a marathon, not a sprint, and you do have to pace yourself. So I would say make sure you are hydrated. In some ways, it's like I don't get on the Peloton unless I know I'm hydrated and I've had enough that my blood sugar is going okay. Because if I get on the Peloton, it doesn't it almost doesn't matter how intense the ride is. Um, if I get on my spinning bike to nowhere and I have not adequately prepared my body or if my back is tweaked, uh, I'm going to experience panic and nausea at some point. I just know that. And that is analogous, I think, to the writing experience. So make sure that you are sufficiently hydrated. Make sure you're in a comfortable chair. Ergonomic support is very important. You got to figure out all that stuff. Google it. It's a good idea. Um, make sure your physical body is prepared because writing is a physical act. And it is important because you're, you're not going to be like, look, if you're writing and I've had these experiences where I sit down and I'm like, OK, time to go. And sometimes you just barf stuff out at first and then you get into a flow and you start doing it. If your chair is all fucked up and your seating is all messy and you haven't had enough water to drink, you didn't eat something, you're going to start to experience physical pain and you may be in the flow state, but your physical pain is going to interrupt the flow state. So you're setting yourself up for failure if you are 
mistreating your body as a writer. And we often think that when you're writing, you're not just up in your head. You are doing this physically, this repetitive motion like anything else. So first and foremost, prepare your body, prepare your environment. Second of all, understand that for you're going to figure it out for yourself. But for me, when I've written, like I adapted one of my books, DC Trip as a feature. And so for, I would say for every three hours that I devoted to writing time, quote unquote, not sitting the whole time, you got to get up, you got to stretch, et cetera. Uh, for every three hours, I probably got 45 good minutes of writing. And even that, I'm talking about 45 good minutes of raw material, and that still needs to be refined. So understand that everybody's ratio is going to be different there. Some people, I'm sure, can sit down and just go, three hours of brilliance. <laughs> I will refine it later. I've never met them, but they exist. <laughs> Maybe. Um, give yourself enough time. Give yourself enough time, and you'll figure out what enough time is. I really like for people who are in any artistic discipline whatsoever or who want to be, I like The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. I think it's a really helpful program. Have you ever done it? Mm -mm. It's helpful if you're ever feeling stuck. If you're ever just feeling in a rut where you're like, this doesn't feel good. Why does my writing not feel good? Like why does, uh, like you're just getting frustrated with stand up or whatever it may be. Um, it's a 12 week program. You buy the book. She has you write morning pages. It's three longhand pages. Um, pages just like every morning and there's little writing exercises throughout but it's meant it's called a creative recovery and it's very much inspired by her experience with self 12 step programs but you don't have to be a 12 step program person to to benefit from it so that helps that helps me get creatively unstuck um stephen king's on writing is one of the best it's a memoir it's a writing guide it's one of the best books on writing i've ever read and do you know the story of that book? Mm -mm. Do you remember years ago, Stephen King was walking along like the country road where he lives in Maine and he got hit mm -hmm. by a van and um, almost died. And his I think his pelvis had to be reconstructed. And so when that happened, he was in the middle of writing a guide to writing. And so the book on writing became half guidebook and half memoir. And it's really beautiful. It's very powerful, a very powerful. Again, another writer talking about addiction. He talks about his experience with addiction as well. That's a really good one. People often, when I get stuck, I had a teacher told me when you get stuck, read Pablo Neruda. Um, sometimes I'll read translations of Rumi. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I will read poetry by Maya Angelou. Um, I will read specific things. People who write in a very different or who wrote beautifully in a very different way than me for some poetry helps me because I'm not necessarily a poetry person. I don't write poetry, mm -hmm. but because it gets my brain working in a different way. I watch episodes of Broad City. That helps too. Yeah, I relate to that. And that, that I, um, what often helps me get out of a rut of like, feeling like I'm, I don't I'm cannibalizing too much of my comedy or I'm just like on the road so much so I don't have any life to write about and so half the time I'm like oh, I need to go do something but I usually find that I just need to sit and relax and recharge and um watch comedy usually not stand up usually something else that um just inspires me and makes me see what it Sometimes it is stand up. Sometimes I need to see what is possible, what other people are doing. And but usually it has to be people who are doing things completely different from me. Like I like going to see Reggie Watts or um even someone like Joey Diaz, who is like just completely different style from me that makes me inspired about like, oh well, I would never like talk about that, but like, what's my take on that type of subject? Or what does that make me think about? Or if I, a lot of times, that's what I like about going to the comedy store is that my set sometimes is the reaction to the sets I see before me. That's cool. So it's usually just like, like a lot of times I see sets and they're just like, you know, they're hyper masculine or they're hyper, or I, just in specific, I saw Chris D'Elia doing a set talking about like, 
He's sick of these adults talking about Paddington Bear and what about <laughs> why what why would adults watch cartoons? And then I get up there and I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Paddington Bear is one of the best damn movies of the last five, ten years. It is heartbreaking. It is heartbreakingly beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It's no right to be that good. It's amazing. It's I, I watch Whitney Cummings Instagram stories. Uh, I watch um, meaning when I need to get when I'm in a rut in addition to the other stuff that I said and episodes of Broad City um, I'll watch Whitney's Instagram stories cause something's always happening something animal related is happening Usually. she's interviewing somebody or she's peeing on her yeah, property something's happening at the house which is this beautiful house um, she and Benton are doing something hilarious like I'll watch that I'll watch Amanda Seal's Instagram stories there's going to be an opinion that I'm going to see and it's going to be interesting. Um, I will watch. I will watch. Uh, I, you know, I end up rewatching a lot of Broad City, which is funny. Um, I mean, it's funny, but it's also weird that like I'll rewatch it. Just it's so joke stuffed. Some mm -hmm. episodes are, and sometimes it's visual. It's a visual joke. It's not necessarily obviously um, like uh, a dialogue, but. If I'm stuck on, even if I'm stuck, like I'm right now, I'm trying to write um, a book proposal for a young adult novel. And that, I've been watching Astronomy Club. I listen to audiobooks. Sometimes I lay down flat on my back. So that's good for me because there's a lot happening here. So I spend, I try to spend time laying down flat and stretching or just laying down flat. And I go to a chiropractor. I, I tweaked my neck eating Zanku chicken on Thanksgiving with oh, too much happened. enthusiasm. You get at it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had to, I, cause it, Zanku chicken is so good. Yeah. It's so good. It's the Armenian delight of mm -hmm. our times. And I had to, well, it's like Lebanese and Armenian. It's so good. Make a whole family murder. Each I other. love that story. I mean, I hate the story, but the writing, mm -hmm. the writing of that piece about the Zanku chicken murders is some of the best food writing and crime writing I've ever read. That's so fun because now some people who don't live where we live are going mm -hmm. to look it up and they're going to have a, a fun evening. Oh, they really are. Oh, it's beautifully written. So once upon a time, can we tell the story in brief? Well, I feel like people should find oh, out. Right. Okay. Yeah, it occurred in the- Halston's like, Halston's like Ooh, <laughs> It is really, it's, it was the piece that was written that I'm referring to that you've probably read as well was written- for either the LA Weekly or the LA Times or the LA something mm -hmm. in the year of our Lord, maybe 2000, 2001, maybe 2008. I don't know. But the point is this. There's murder. There's mayhem. There's Armenian drama. I'm always here for that. I feel very, <laughs> if I can be around, I mean, my mom's side is Sicilian and Italian and like secretly Arab. And if I can ever be around a culture of people where when the older people are agreeing with each other. They look like they're disagreeing because they're yelling so loud or they just look so pissed, but they're agreeing. I feel very at home, which opens a lot of the Middle East to me. It <laughs> opens a lot of Africa to me. It opens a lot of, of cultures that I don't come from because I'm like, those old people look like they're very mad at each other, but they are agreeing wholeheartedly about, about something. Hug, yeah. They're agreeing about politics or some cousin who they think is trash. And I'm like, oh, I feel good. This feels so good. Oh yeah, that's a great story. Hawson, quit looking up the Zanku chicken right, thing. It's a violent story that is not a movie because I bet nobody can get the rights. Cause, yeah, because yeah. that chicken place don't want it. They don't want to get it. Oh yeah. Like, hey, you know, we're trying to put that under the rug. So this rotisserie Just, chicken, baby. And it's so good. It works. So I got, I couldn't go. I was supposed to go see my friend Curtis on Thanksgiving and have some Chinese food and donuts as one does traditionally. But I couldn't because I tweaked my neck i forget what i was even talking about because i got so excited about zangu chicken it's okay i got I love, no questions i'm a host i know you're really good at it thank you i'm still excited to be here thank you for coming here's one thing i wanted to talk to you about one of the reasons i wanted you here is um you're like a really good friend and a good person uh and i wanted to bring up the thing they were talking about and it's going to lead a lot of different ways maybe we'll disagree on things it's fun but um i remember um I made a joke about a guy who reviewed my special who then got in trouble in our community for sexual assault. And Ooh. then I was like, 
um, making some couple jokes about it. And some people got mad because they thinking I was making light of sexual assault. And you retreated one of my jokes I was talking about. And then someone brought it up to you and was like, oh, I didn't know you supported this type of guy. I'm going to take back this book that I, I <laughs> bought from, you know, who knows if they bought it. But you know how they made the claim. Stuff like this kind of happens to me a lot. So I'm, I'm like remembering it now because I think I'm sorry, I'm to you. Tell me if I'm correct about this. Did I respond and go like, thank you. I understand if you need to mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, that's exactly how you respond. You're basically how I remember it. And who knows if I'm fully correct was that you go like, thank you for being a fan of mine. I appreciate it. And I understand if you feel that way. But the gist of it was that I'm not going to, I know Ron and I know he's, I know who he is. And if I'm not going to let someone else tell me not to be friends with someone who I enjoy. Yeah. And, and, um, and I, I think whatever it was, I hadn't known the full context, mm -hmm. but even when I did know the full context, and I think I might've said that, but I think even when I did know the full context and I don't remember if the whole, we don't have to retread it. Cause I'm sure it was a little, bit of a pain in the ass for you as those things always are but even when i did know the full cause i i remember being like well that's that's my that's my friend like and you're funny like <laughs> it's my friend and you if you're funny and you're my friend uh you're my friend and you're funny like it just doesn't get that much more complicated although i understand so, like i have plenty we have friends in entertainment who say rather daring things Sometimes I say things that are not nice. Uh, I'm not saying you said anything not nice. I'm saying sometimes there have been times I was thinking about it when I was driving over, actually, that there have been times when I've been rude and reactive to people who criticized me online mm -hmm. or I've been snarky or shitty. And there are some people who I'm sure go, look at this tweet she did. She's an asshole. And from their perspective, they are correct in that moment. But uh, people who know me hopefully still love me. And once in a while, maybe you end up talking to one of those people who thinks you're an asshole who's a stranger and they sort of come around. I'm sorry, I took that. I, that's, I'm no, talking but that's over exactly you. what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about is that um well mostly it just which is a shame because i love I, I love talking shit it's why i got into the stand-up and love people get so shit. mad when you talk shit because people get so mad i've noticed this specifically about you because because you are a person who is kind joyful because your demeanor is gentle they get mad when you don't, when they have become fans of yours and have a particular idea of what they want you to be, it is not the fullness of you because you are a whole complex human being as we all are. And I guess this, what I'm saying is not groundbreaking. It doesn't just apply to you, but I have noticed it with you. They get mad when you clap back at people or when you tell somebody to fuck off, they like, they get so mad like it's a betrayal of the aspects of you that give affirmations that are kind and loving like, oh, he's hiding this beast inside. It's like, no, the beast is right there. The beast is gentle and loving and the beast is angry and the beast. I mean, I remember one time I was at a I, I think I must have gone to see you headline at Caroline's or something. Do you and I think it was you, right? Like, um. And I remember somebody in the audience like mouthed something at you, repeating a joke you had made that was not this person's place to repeat back to you. Mm -hmm. And you were very overtly unhappy with that. And you made that known and carried on with the show. And like, that's what we get to do. We get to talk back to people who insult us or who are rude or who mouth a word that perhaps is not theirs to mouth back at us with laughter in their eyes. Like, you mm -hmm. know, you get to do that. Do you find that though? Or am I projecting that no, shit on you? I, I feel 100% like it happens. find that, that yeah. because be and it's, it's a lot of things. It is, partially racial because then the people will put me as kind of like you're the magical black person mm -hmm. like well, you know? you're a non-threatening special in their mind they've decided that they're not afraid of you without any without inquiring of you hey ron do you ever feel anger like a human yeah <laughs> they've decided 
that you are for some reason acceptable to them in a way that, and this is all also, I don't, as, as a white person who has my own problems and racism and prejudices and things that sometimes I'm not even aware of. And then I bump up against it. I'm like, Ooh, that's there. Um, I don't think it's conscious for these people. It's like so automatic ingrained in them. He hits boom, boom, boom. These markers that were taught to me or that I decided when I was a baby (laughs) or was encoded in my DNA of knowledge, this makes him acceptable. And then you go something that goes like hits the wrong pinball thing that lights up and they're like, yeah, he has betrayed me. Mm-hmm. I invented an idea for him and he has betrayed that idea. Yeah. That's what I find it usually to be is that they have this reductive view of me as this kind of care bear, which I partially am, but also like I said, full person. And I, I will, and, and, that's what I love in art and that's what I love in any artist is the ability to explore all aspects of myself, the ability to look into the bad parts of my brain and try to extract humor from those and to um, shy away from that to me would be a real detriment to my comedy and, and really just probably ruin my career because then it would be all softness. It would be boring. It would be a cartoon character. It would be a real person. And so, um, Yeah, I have a big problem with that. Usually now I'm thinking about just turning over my social media to um, to my assistant and stuff just because I I love talking with people and I love having the thing. But um, when I find myself when it doesn't matter to me when I don't have a job because it's like I'll lose 500 followers, a thousand followers. Fine. I'll get them. They'll come back when I do some other project. Right. But But, when you play baby Yoda as an adolescent next season or whatever, you know, like when you're working for Disney, you're working for ABC or the same company, NBC, whoever it is, then you have more eyes on you. Yeah. And you could, if you talk back to somebody who has insulted you if you defend yourself or you go after them or whatever it may be. And sometimes that's the same thing. Um, Sometimes, you know, the best defense is a great offense. (laughs) Like whatever it may be, you risk. I mean, uh, this, there's probably a mortgage on this place, you know, Mm -hmm. like your kid probably has tuition at school. Like there's probably um, the food that people in this home eat probably costs money. Like at that point, if it's reaching into your pocketbook, I think it's a good idea to turn it over. Well, I have friends, and I know you do too, I'm sure, who've done that. And Mm -hmm. it is a mental health saver. It really is. That's what I think, because I just find myself, because I I started really just trying to live a life where, like, I don't need your criticism. I don't need your praise. And I have to, and part of me used to really want that praise and loves that praise. And part of me still wants that praise. Oh, it's natural. And I get it on stage, so that's fine. But I would go looking for it in the comments and things like that. And then when I hit the criticism, I would bump me up and I'd be way more likely to respond to someone being shitty, especially like my podcast or things. I get an issue when people like if I have bigger guests on and like they're there for that guest and they'll be like, they'll go on the YouTube and be like, here's when this guest starts. So if you want to skip all the fucking, if you want to skip him talking, you know, and I just get so mad. I'm like, it's so like, it's my fucking podcast. Don't be mm-hmm. so dim disrespectful, you know? And you're bringing in different people too. Like you're bringing the, the, the small but mighty Sarah Ben and Casa crowd is a different crowd than if you have Rogan on is a different crowd than if you had Whitney on is a different crowd. Chris is on. It's a different crowd than, you know, Madonna's on. It's a mm-hmm. different crowd when oh Lenny Kravitz what a handsome man when he's on like and so the nature of what they bring Mm -hmm. is different too so the nature of the shittiness in the comments may be different yeah but I always feel like but there's a reason why everybody comes on I'm like there's no there's no one behind this show there's no like thing there's like anyone who comes in on my shows because I want to talk to them and so I feel like there's a value in in talking to all those people, there's just as much value talking to like Dalia is talking to you, is talking to Chris Sharpentier, is talking to to in, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Good, we're all very good looking too. Yeah, it's great. But my main point with talking about um the way you responded to to that person is that like that's your brand though you know that lady is your brand that lady is like uh, you know she's like you're a feminist you're like thing you're supposed to be here to support me and but you're like you're supporting your friend and so to me i i just want to say thank you for that because that's, that's something that um 
is brave. And sometimes some people wouldn't do that. I know I know a fair amount of comedians are the people who would have just hit unretweet and never and never said oh, anything. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, it. well, you, I like you personally. I know we don't spend a lot of time together, but like that doesn't mean I don't like you personally. I don't respect you, but I respect you personally. I've just always had a good feeling about you. And I remember ever since the first time I met you or saw you even, I was like, that person, there's something different about that person. And I think that it is that you have a, your presence was undeniable and unshakable. And the immediate feeling that I got was, this is not whether or not you meant to project it. So I was like, this person does not need anyone here to cater to him. It was like, uh, I would say now I think you have a spine of steel. Um, I don't know if I read that at the time, but I was like, this person has some kind of unshakable core that I think I recognized as someone who had a shakable core. <laughs> I was like, there was just some kind of quiet confidence there. And there are people who have a lot of loud confidence who were around. And sometimes that is genuine and sometimes it is hiding insecurity. So, uh, and I think that part of it was probably the fact that you like must have gone on stage and killed and then came off stage and you did, weren't performing for you. You were having real conversations. It must have been very soon after I moved to LA for the first time because I lived here twice. Um, but, you know, also, the people, a lot of times, yes, the people who, who tend to are like my brand, uh, maybe it's, it's the way I express myself. Someone says it tends to be, um, it tends to be very left, n but, uh, not left enough for some people, but sort of like, um, mainstream to radical left and the radical left people just put up with me because they like me they don't think i'm left enough <laughs> mm -hmm. and i get that or uh, and and you know they'll call me out on shit and i oftentimes will go oh thank you you know that's a i wouldn't have thought of that perspective i appreciate that because usually and sometimes that and, and i mean it if i say thank you i mean it if i don't say thank you it's because i don't want to fuck with you <laughs> but sometimes people will say some shit I'm like oh so it's like a rad left like uh you know i know there's some people who follow me who want to burn down the state and think that i'm like too establishment but they're also like but you know what you really care about people and i respect that <laughs> and then there's people who are sort of my more like i guess you know what would be left if we're looking at the country, right, on a scale of where people tend to fall. If if we go with the theory that Americans tend to be fairly what used to be called moderate, let's say, I would still be to the left of those people. But then there'll be some people who are more moderate and once in a while, a conser more conservative individual who's like, yeah, but you seem like you like people and like you would help me if my car broke down. Um, but they do tend to be very loud. Uh, a lot of people who follow me, I think, follow me because I speak about having dealt with mental health issues. Um, and so they, some of them are in the midst of suffering. And so a lot of the communications that I get privately are from people who are um, who are suffering, uh, I think, because I seem to be some, I appear to be an open book. I'm actually not. <laughs> that is an illusion. <laughs> but I do share more than the average person would probably. And it's always planned. It's always thought out and calculated. And I don't mean that in like a Gargamel way. <laughs> but in a protecting yourself. Way. Yeah. If I'm sharing some, like I've shared that I was in a relationship with somebody who hit me and I didn't leave. Right. Um, that's the only time I, sh I shared something by accident was, uh, was the first time I shared that publicly. I, I don't identify the person. I'm not interested in doing that um, because I know it would cause me more pain than them. And also maybe they've changed, you know, mm. maybe they've healed. Maybe they've, they've moved on. I was doing some asshole stuff years ago and I've healed and moved on and been a better person. So I want to give that person the grace of that. Um, and uh, nor do I think of this person as a menace to society, you know, but there was a time a few years ago, I was on podcast and somebody asked me about what's the time you've most been scared. And we had done a pre-interview. I was going to talk about, it was with Dave Ross, actually. I was going to talk about um, having a panic attack in Sicily and ended up in the hospital when I was 17. And I said, well, one time this guy- Were they out of olive oil? Yeah, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I need some really positive, like- just delicious fill in the blank <laughs> reference to something I can't think of right now. 
<laughs> Arancini, eh. Yeah, I was like, there's no rice balls. So I'm going to fucking freak out. <laughs> <laughs> I go to, oh, I love Little Dom so much. That's another story. Oh, I love Little Dom. Oh. That's the story. Oh, I love <laughs> Little Dom story. so much. Oh, I love it so mm, much. They I've got been great there so chicken parms, meatball sandwiches, great pizza. I went on a first oh. date with somebody who I went on to date for some time. And I didn't remember that we had sex on our first date. Because I was very intoxicated, but I can, it was a, not a non consensual situation. I was like, I'm gonna fuck this dude. But I did remember we went to Little Dom's and he was like, You don't remember that we had sex? And then I was your boyfriend. And I was like, No, I remember the boyfriend. Was that? But oh, Little that Dom's is chicken so good. Parmesan. It's so good. <laughs> oh my God. Monday night supper, a $15 deal. I think it's $17 now. Three courses. Oh, so good. Beautiful. <laughs> so, Can I ask you about what, what are your, some of your goals right now, whether professionally or personally? Something that you're willing to share with us? Oh, we love sure. Goals. Okay. Um, well, I have a, I made a, you know, because I put it online and I thanked you and Haley Marie Norman, two friends I admire who both talk about vision boards. I did a vision board and I want to sell, uh, I want to sell a show um, over the next year of my life. Uh, I've done it before. It's been a minute, so I want to do it again. Right now, I'm starting to write more drama, which I uh, I'm glad, lucky I have reps who support that because they don't always like when you jump tracks, but they've mm -hmm. been very cool about it. So I would like to sell a show. Um, I would like to sell and write another very good book that when I read it, when I sit down and read it, because I don't usually, by the time a book comes out, you have reread it so many times in so many versions that you're sick of it. Um which I don't know if you felt that way about your special, if you sat in on the edit and by the end were sick of it or you were like, I love this. I was sick of it before I shot it. But, I but that's it. how I knew I liked the special was that when I watched it, I didn't hate it. <laughs> that's the most comedian thing you've ever heard. You didn't hate it. Well, I know such a good I was intro. just so I loved done it. with those jokes. But then I watched it and I was like, this is pretty good. I loved it. I love the intro. I loved I love the theater of it. I found it moving and beautiful. Anyway, enough about you and your good goals you've achieved. <laughs> beautiful goals. Um, yeah, I wanna I wanna sell a show. I wanna sell another book. Um, and I wanna do I want when I read the book, when it comes out, because I usually don't reread them. Uh, but when I read it, I'm gonna read it when it comes out, and I want to say to myself. I did something better here. I've gotten better. I've, I'm a better writer now. Cause I was, you know, I say that I was saying to my shrink right before I came here, I was like, I quit drinking when my workaholism got in the way of my alcoholism. <laughs> I did five books in, they came out 2012 to 2016. And uh, I was writing, I was drinking. I was, juggling other gigs i was working really hard i was burning myself out i wasn't taking care of myself so starting in 2017 i started to take care of myself um with food with water that was fun and uh then you know the alcohol stuff the getting sober stuff um slowing down my life meditating getting some spirituality in my life starting to think about what is my concept of God? Do I have one? How does this work? You know, doing a vision board very much feels like an act of prayer to me. And so now I'm like, well, the next time I deliver something creative of substance to the world, it better, I want it to be fucking better. Mm. I want it to be better because I didn't take a few years off from churning shit out all the time. My version of churning shit out, I was still publishing stuff, but not books. Like, I didn't take a few years off from books to come back and be like, oh, I wrote this thing I'm not proud of. And mm -hmm. that's that's independent of critical review. Of like, course. yes, I want the critics to love it, but um, I want to be proud of it. I think that's what's uh, most important. That's what part of being an artist, right, is that we always want um, to us, is whether it's the last book, last show, whatever. You your know, next it's special our... is going to be different from the one you did. Mm -hmm. You're going to look at your next special and go, oh, this is you know, people are going to love your, always love that special. I will always love that special, but your next special, you're going to look at and go, oh, this, I've grown. 
that's the plan that's i mean that's really like i don't even want to think about shooting one until i'm like oh this is much better than what i've did before this is growth from what i've done before this is me going deeper and more into my life and more confident in who i am and more um just more me that's what i want to do and just that's my goals for my vision for for 2020 is just to be confident in myself and just really shine and and not be like oh this is the thing i need to change before i'm ready or this is the thing i need to do before i'm ready i want to be like i'm ready for whatever the universe wants to bring me now you know like i and if i'm not ready i'll get ready you know when mm -hmm. it's time for that i don't have to stop i don't need to put these blocks in front of myself but i, I think you're right the vision board is a, a form of prayer i think it's saying to yourself that you believe that the universe is there to provide for you and, and will work with you if you're willing to put in the effort to go halfway and and to write these things out, to say them out loud is saying to the universe, like, I'm not just silent about it. I'm not just thinking these things secretly when people ask me what I want to do. And I go, oh, I'm just, hope, you know, whatever comes my way. But I, of course, you secretly know what you want to do. I am I think it's a real power to go, this is what I want. This is what I want to do. And maybe I'll fall on my face, but I want to say it out loud because it gives those words power. It gives the people who have ability to come help me. They know what I need help in. Mm -hmm. You know, no people one can. can't. There are people out there who want to help you, but they can't unless they know what you want to do. So if I just go, I'd like to do more creative stuff. It's like, no, I want to create or co-create an hour-long drama series and sell that show. I want to write a book. I, I want to, you know, right now I think it's a novel. I want to write a novel. I want to sell that novel. Uh, I want to get into a healthy, committed relationship if that is, you know, that's the one where I'm like um, very much like if it's time, if it's, if it's time, because I put that out there. But um, with the career stuff, I feel more comfortable going, yep, I want that in the next year. With the healthy, committed relationship thing, it's like it's only healthy if it's the right time for mm -hmm. both people. Oh, it's hard. Yeah, you can't force it. You can't force it. I can't. There's no rep I can lean on. There's <laughs> no like, you know, oh, wow, I should definitely submit to the blacklist. I should definitely submit to Sundance Labs. You right? can submit to the blacklist. I'm going dating, to. But it's different. <laughs> it's would, a different thing. It would be thing. funny if I submitted it and I was like, dear Franklin, <laughs> <laughs> can you please, if you read uh, if you read something by somebody who you think should be my mm, boyfriend, can you? Yeah. He'd be like, okay, Sarah. The blacklist no, for no. dating it's just bald black dudes and turtlenecks named richard <laughs> <laughs> they're pretty cool <laughs> i just want a boyfriend so i think i'll just call my reps like you know that's there's more of a even though we are in an industry that is not a it's not a clear hierarchy in the way that say if you want to be a lawyer there's steps laid out for you targets you hit or miss um even let there are certain things you can do to set yourself up well like my agents called me last week they were like hey did you write that hour-long drama that you outlined that we think is great i was like no i didn't start it yet they're like okay this is a nudge to do that because opportunities are coming up and we want to submit you for them but we do not have that essential piece they didn't say it in such a way they did say nudge though and they're like because we think you have a shot at this that's why they're working with me they think they're gonna make money off me that's mm -hmm. how this works mm -hmm. and i was like oh Oh, you're right. I gotta. I was like thinking out loud. I was like, I gotta give you the tool to do the job. They were like, Yup. <laughs> That's the thing. Like we have to, but but there's no other than working on yourself in whatever ways that means to you. You know, there was no way that you could find a robot, for example, by like mail order briding. You could, but like there's no count that it I will work. She was. <laughs> There's no way you can get yourself in. There's no perfect box you can fit yourself into. You know, it happens when it's time for it to happen or it doesn't happen. And that's okay. But I think what what can happen is a healthy um, relationship with yourself and with dating and with like, oh, I'm dating to have fun. I'm mm -hmm. dating to enjoy these people and meet new people. And I'm what really I think 
got me ready for a robot was the way I changed the way I was dating. I wasn't dating to get laid that night. I wasn't dating. In fact, that's what was the rule I make because I listened to some rappers and they were like, the best move you can make is just don't even, don't even try to touch them on the first date. And I was like, dude, it works really well. <laughs> It does. It works great. It does. Because they make them go, what's going on? Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's amazing. It's shockingly powerful. You're like, wait, you what? But he wants to go out again? Mm -hmm. Like, what? Oh, he just talking. wants to talk to me? I was talking to my shrink about a situation like that right before I got over here. I was like, uh, it was just nice. I just had a good time. And it was just an enjoyable time getting to know somebody. And uh, I felt like maybe I needed to go do some weird dramatic shit because I felt uncomfortable. And she was like, that's a pattern we're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like, that's what I would have done in the past because um, intimacy is frightening. And I used to think that intimacy just meant, I was like, I don't have a problem with it. It's me. Intimacy, I have sex on the first date like whenever I want to. That's not intimacy. Intimacy is allowing somebody to see you and know you and allowing your heart to soften to the point where um, you know that you could be hurt, but, you know, that's the risk you take. You're in it because it's important. And 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 so that, um, yeah, like in as I'm in this place where I'm starting to date again, which I took a break from during, you know, working on the sobriety stuff. But um, as I'm dating it, I have to be like, you know, I went out with somebody the other night and the one thing that I was lovely, I learned some interesting things about the country that he's from and that was it. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one dude recommended uh, on an app who I didn't even end up going out with, recommended a really good audiobook about Genghis Khan. And I've been listening to it and I love it. I keep putting it up on Instagram. I'm like, did you know that they used explosives in an amazing way? The Mongol armies were fascinating. And I have like, there's some sons of Genghis Khan who I think are okay. There's some sons who I think are trash. The grandchildren are better. Like, you know, like I get into it. I love these stories. And I wouldn't have gotten that if I hadn't gone on this app, talk to a nice person and knock on out with them. That's kind of fun. Yeah. Sometimes you just end up eating at a cool restaurant being like, okay, bye. Thanks. Yeah, and that's it. And a lot of people get so afraid that it either like they they have to sleep with them or they're gonna get um att attacked, which is thing that can mm -hmm. happen. But there's like there's ways to safeguard yourself and go into you know picking the times and making sure you're not just dating a stranger. Out I of the always blue. let people know where I am, um, because you know some things you simply cannot. Some things you cannot you cannot wish away or protect yourself from, but a lot of things you can you can take steps, right? Like I'm going to get my car. I can't control the fact there's drunk drivers on the road who might hit me. Um, I can just do the best I can do with my vehicle and how I operate it. So for me, when I go on dates, I always let people know where I am, like friends. And I tell them it's kind of like how you'll say, oh, text me. People will say, text me when you get home. I'll do that for people. I'll do the same thing. I'll text them. I'll be like, okay, I'm home safe. And um, also for that reason, I sometimes like taking Lyft, even though of course things happen with Lyft and Uber. But I'm like, well, if I'm with this person and I go to their house or something in theory and uh, my body ends up in a ditch, there'll be some kind of record to where I might perhaps be. Dating is fun. <laughs> but yeah, and also you don't have to you don't have to fall in love uh, uh, aside from the physical danger. Let's get into like emotional danger for a second. You don't have to stay on a date. If somebody is making you uncomfortable or you simply don't like them, you can say, you can just slip out the back Jack, so to speak, or you can say, this doesn't work for me. Bye. Yeah. Like, you know, I feel like that. And mostly a lot of guys appreciate that because they'll be like, we're not wasting this whole time mm -hmm. and I can go back home, and play video games or something. Yeah. I think that is a great move. I mean, some the worst that'll happen is the guy will be like, she was a bitch, you know, and you should be able to handle that and take that. But one of my one of the jokes I felt the most in life um, was on Unbreakable Cammy Schmidt, where they were interviewing some of the girls after they got out of the um, what's being kidnapped from by John Hamm. Um, and then one of the ladies just goes like, she's like, why didn't you, why did you go on this date with him? Why didn't, she's like, I thought some of the stuff he said was crazy and I didn't want to go back to his uh, ho hobble with him, but I also didn't want to be rude. And then, <laughs> yes. And then Matt Lauer yes. just goes, hmm. The length women are willing to go to to not be rude to men. <laughs> yeah. So as you have to be rude, 
You do. And that's hard. I don't like being rude to anybody. Ooh, I really don't like it. But sometimes you got to do it. And it's so hard because you're so everything in you is trained to be like, oh, my God, really? You like to kill people for fun? Tell me more. (laughs) That's cool. Okay, that sounds like a job. Like, and I get it. I get it because it's just. Um, But sometimes you have to. And. You know, I blocked somebody um, on I had the, they had my number. We were texting, talking about going out and they said something. And I was just like, nope, bye. And just blocked them because so what if they think I'm an asshole? I don't want to talk to that person. That person took took what I believe to be an inappropriate liberty. Everybody's got their own line. It doesn't matter that I didn't give them a chance to apologize. I'm playing a numbers game here. I'm in dating in a city. Like I wasn't so fall if if I felt such a deep connection with this individual that some that they had given some offense, I would say, hey, that that bothered me. Can we talk about that? I really don't like that. Um, or don't do that again or whatever, maybe. And hopefully they would respect that and course correct as I would if I were into somebody. But I was like, no, forget it. I just don't want to bother this person bother me. I don't want to hear the apologies. I don't want that's okay. Yeah, you be I rude. believe in dating efficiently, and like, hey, if you're not, if it's not a match, it's not hit. I think the thing that came from me from being a single parent while I was dating out here is just that, like, oh, if we're wasting time, I, I, then I'm. This is time I'm taking away from my son that I could be doing something with him, helping him with his homework or whatever, mm-hmm. instead of chasing you around or going to some bar. So this isn't gonna work. This is inefficient for me, and I can't. I have to remove myself from the situation. And I just think that. um more women especially should date like that and like i'm not getting what i want from this i should move on and whether that is like a casual thing and you're just having fun with each other but whatever you want don't and there's just so many times even and i've dated women like that who just were like this isn't what i want but i'm hoping with enough time you'll change i'm hoping you'll be more interested in me or women who i was like look this isn't going to be a thing where i'm not going to be your boyfriend i'm going to continue to date other people and i they would say they were cool but i knew deep down sometimes they were not and it's just like but you have to you have to be like if it's not working for me now it's probably not going to work for me in the future oh yeah that's i mean some of the some people who i remain friends with are people who i have um dated or seen or banged for a time and been like oh no this isn't working for me and i've said it to them or they've said it to me and yes it stings a bit when one of but we're in general agreement about it. It's hard if one of you feels that way and the other one doesn't, then it's tough and that's just, but there was somebody I went on a few dates with recently and I found out that uh, he didn't like dogs. And anyway, I was feeling along the way that maybe this wasn't gonna work out as a long-term thing, but it was fun. And I was like, you know what? He doesn't like dogs. I like dogs. So eventually, well, I don't think we're gonna get married, but also what's the point? Come on, like, we, you know, eventually I'm going to get a dog. So let's say we keep fucking in a few months when I get a dog, he's not going to be able to come over. And what's the point? Let's nip this in the bud so we can be friends. And so uh, we talked and I was like, hey, how are you feeling about us seeing each other? And uh, he was like, oh, basically the message that I got was like, he didn't want to say he's not into it because maybe he'd get laid. And I appreciate that. I respect it. I've done the same thing. So I was just like, listen, <laughs> um, do you are you into this he was like i'm really having fun going on dates with you but i don't think this is a long-term thing i was like see that wasn't hard to say i feel the same way you're super hot it's been fun let's just be friends and we are friends he's cool i mean he doesn't like dogs which is weird but also not cats there might be something going on there but you know we're still friends and i have other friends who um you know, we dated for a brief period of time or we saw each other and we just both it was clear to both of us this wasn't gonna be a thing but um there's plenty of fish in the sea. We can bang other people. But if we enjoy each other enough to genuinely mean it, when we say, let's still be friends, then like we still end up being friends. Yeah. It's cool. Like it's you end cool. up meeting, suppose you fuck your way into a nice casual friendship. <laughs> it's very it's beautiful. Hawson just got another clip. <laughs> <laughs> Last thing we want to talk about is just the same thing we ask everyone on this podcast. It's just for a piece of advice, a thing maybe you've been chewing on thinking about something that you think could help our getting better audience it's very vague but you'll nail it okay um this is almost i think this is like a rip from the poet 
uh, Rilke. <laughs> um, it's uh, letters to a young poet, I think, but I think he says something along along the lines of, and this is not an exact quote, but but be patient with everything that's unanswered in your heart. So, and there are many versions of that from many wisdom traditions and faith traditions and philosophers, but um, be patient. Be patient with yourself if you don't have all the answers. The fact, remind yourself, the fact that you are engaging with these questions of how do I want to feel? Who do I want to be? Who am I? The fact that you are even engaging with this means that you are getting better because you are not willing to stay stuck anymore in your habits and your beliefs and your family structure and whatever it may be that is hurting you. But remember to, as you continue to prod yourself to move forward, be patient and be okay with a lack of answers because they will arrive eventually. And if they don't arrive, you are not meant to have that answer. I think that's beautiful and very accurate and just knowing that change takes time and sometimes we get into these positions and we get frustrated and we get angry and we go like, oh, that's it. It's got to change. And then so you expect it to just stop. But it's like you've already put so much energy, karma, whatever you want to call it, into that negative situation that it is going to take some time for that for that flow to course cor correct for everything to start going into that positive way. You may have like, made that change and cut it but it will still take time for everything to 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 match up with what with what you're doing now and so i think you have to be patient you have to um just be really really nice to yourself mm -hmm. and just uh wait and just know that things will pass and i think that's some of the best advice that anybody could Good, good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. No, of course. Thank you. Being being kind to yourself is not the same as being complacent. Being kind to yourself is not the same as excusing when you do some fuck shit. <laughs> That's not it. It's saying, oh, I did that thing again that I don't. I cheated on my wife again. I don't want you on my wife anymore. Or but I, that's me. But that's me. <laughs> she loves me and my dick is so huge. One woman can't take all of it. And that's why I got divorced. I've never been divorced, but if I were a man, that's probably why I'd get divorced. <laughs> but, you know, it's saying to yourself, okay, I did that thing. I don't feel good about it, um, but I still love myself. I'm going to go to a therapist. I'm going to go to my, you know, my pastor who actually gives good advice and isn't a weirdo or like whoever it is. I'm going to keep working on this. I'm going to pray. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to do whatever I need to do. Like it's, it's allowing yourself to be human while still trying to move yourself forward. I think that's excellent. Thank you for coming and talking with Thank me. Thank you. I'm such a fan of the show. This, this is very special to me. And I, of course, really like and respect you so much. So it's an honor to be here. Well, I like it. I respect you. And I think you're a great writer and just a great person and a u unique person and a powerful force. And that's probably why you get to act two or three times a year <laughs> is because people, people just like you and they want to be here. And that says a lot about you, you know? So, um, and I like you and I'm grateful for knowing you and I appreciate you coming. Thank you. I will play a barista on your show, any show you have, anytime. Okay, tell them good. You got the right hair for it. I do. I'm like, hi, do you want a, a flat white, a macchiato? Yeah, she's like, she's like, oh, she's frazzled. This is a day <laughs> job. She went to a liberal arts college and barely graduated. <laughs> and she's like almost 40. This feels right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. Bye. If you enjoyed that episode, you might want to look at our last episode located right here. And perhaps you want a special episode picked just for you by our overlords at YouTube. Right there. And do not forget to subscribe. Beep, 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 beep. Thank you. <laughs>